Good morning. Each week of this Easter season, we remind ourselves why we gather. We are forming a habit of spending time together, praising God together, and having goodwill for all people. In the account of the early church, they did just that. Scripture says, day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. Friends, at the heart of the matter, we are connected through the spirit that makes us one in love. Today, we are invited to keep Jesus' commandments to love one another. To love one another is to keep each other in our hearts, despite the fact that we cannot gather together. Let us prepare our hearts to worship God together. We keep all our friends in our hearts. We keep hope in our hearts. We keep gratitude in our hearts. That is the heart of the message today. Let us be praying this repeat after me prayer. Holy and living God, we gather in your name. Invited by Jesus, bound together with your spirit, in union with one another, into your care we offer now our worries, fears, and strife. We turn to you and know you're near, your light, our love, and life. Let's light our candles now and set our heart worry stones next to them.
Minster United Methodist Church. This is Miss Jackie, and I am outside on my deck on a glorious, glorious day. I think it's Wednesday, and today was a big day for us. We saw, well, actually, I will give credit where credit is due. Pastor Malcolm saw our first Hummer, and we have a hummingbird feeder there, and this is where we come and we kind of just chill. Um, from usually it's from April till October but this year it's the middle of May <laughs> to October but I'm here today to do the kids time with you about the heart of the matter and in this we are going to make a heart and we are going to put on this heart everybody and everything we've missed since we've been home here in this quarantine I'm going to show you mine and then I'm going to show you how to do it. So this is, this is my heart and on it I have some pictures of Harrison and Brittany and Danny, my daughter and son-in-law. I have my mom and dad. I have Beth and her boyfriend Austin and then I have things that I wrote as well. I have, I've missed Wesley Seminary. I've missed some of my uh, nephews. I miss my Sunday school classes. I miss traveling. I miss my brother and sister. All kinds of things are on this heart that keeps it, it reminds me that they are, that they, they are still there. They are, they are there, but in my heart, my heart's a little empty because I miss them so much. Our story today, what Pastor Malcolm was talking about, was from John, and it talks about how, you know, when, on Easter Sunday, Jesus rose, and then kind of he stays with us. He stays in our hearts. Jesus stays in our hearts and becomes sort of like a friend we can always talk to, even though sometimes we can't see him. And that's, you know, these people, you know, I could, I could talk to them, but I can't see him in real life. And it, it does sometimes get, get me sad, but by putting this on this, this was a great activity to do. And it's real, real easy. You just take a red piece of paper, fold it in half like this. You make a heart, or you, if you're better at drawing, you could just draw a heart and cut it out. But I, I'm not good at drawing all my children and uh, my husband got my creative. But you make a heart here. And see, it comes out like a heart, like remember when we talked about the doodling. And then on this heart, you can put pictures. You can work with your mom and you can put some pictures that you find. Like I'm putting this picture of our whole family on it. You can then write things on it. You can draw little pictures if you want. And this heart shows everything that you're missing and that you can say little prayers for. I know a lot of people at night say little prayers for people that they miss. And this heart can help you remember all those people it is that you, you miss. You also can use the back of it if you run out of room. And you could put things as well as people. So I just hope it was so good to talk to you today, and I just hope that you can, you will um, think this week of all, the, all of people that you're missing, and um, and just write those out so they can be on your heart and you can remember them. Now let us say a prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this gorgeous day today. Oh my goodness. And we give you thanks for all the children that are here with us this morning and their parents. We just ask that you give them some time to remember um, those that, that they are missing. And they can write pictures. They can do um, write them with words, Lord, and put it on their heart. Put the, put the heart somewhere so that they can remember all that they, that, that, and to know that you are with us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
This is from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. And in this reading, the resurrected Jesus tells his disciples that the Spirit will be with them when he is gone. If you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another companion, another helper to be with you always, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot accept since the world neither sees nor recognizes. But you can recognize the spirit because the spirit remains with you and will be within you. I won't leave you orphaned. I will come back to you a little while now and the world will see me no more but you will see me because i live and you will live as well on that day you'll know that i am in god and you are in me and i am in you those who obey my commandments are the ones who love me and those who love me will be loved by abba god I too will love them and reveal myself to them. Before the second reading, I'll share this with you. Doing the right thing is something we try hard to do. Sometimes doing the right thing is difficult and means we make sacrifices to make sure we do not harm others. We do it because love is the commandment we live by. In this excerpt from an early church letter, we hear the apostle encourage the people to always be ready to share from their hearts about the source of hope that is in them, Jesus Christ. Reading now from 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 16a. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting of the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence the word of god for the people of god thank you ronnie friends join me in a moment of prayer holy god as we gather together we reflect on your love for us help us to find ways that we can share your love with others loving you and loving others is who jesus calls us to be may the words of my mouth the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, today we gather reminding ourselves that the church is not a place that we go to. Rather, the church is who we are and where we are. What this means is that while I'm standing here in the chancel of Center in Maine, the church without walls now resides in your home. And it's evident by how you actually act in your house and everywhere you go, every single place that you find yourself, that's where the church is, in the market, on the streets, in the parks, and yes, even here in this place. In the words of the hymn that's very familiar to us, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is what? Yes, it's the people. Today, and over these last couple of weeks, we are focusing on John's Gospel. And today, we're celebrating the thoughts that Jesus is giving to his disciples. Jesus is soon to be leaving his followers, and he is wanting them to take care of the teachings that he has passed on to them. It's relying upon them to perpetuate the process of making disciples of him. If you turn to your Bibles and to John chapter 14, verse 15, you'll see that Jesus qualifies this gift that he has for us. He says to us, if you love me, you will do as I command you. What do you suppose Jesus has commanded? 
Oh my goodness. I mean, there are loads of places that we can go with that. He may be referencing uh, what he had just talked to his disciples about in John's story in chapter 13. Jesus washes their feet and then he calls them that if he is their Lord and master and he serves them, that they're called to serve one another. Not just serve, but also to love one another. And by this action, people will know that they are followers of his. If you love him, we will do as he commands. And Jesus summed up all of the commandments in Matthew 22 when a lawyer asked him, what is the greatest of all commandments by saying that we are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus tells them that if they love him, they will follow this command. Now, this is not a sentimental feeling of love. That can't be commanded. We cannot be commanded to feel love for something else. Rather, this is more of an action form of love, similar to what uh, James speaks about in his own uh, letter, where he's challenging followers that he's going to show his faith in Jesus by the way that he examples his love in action. Jesus is binding our love of Jesus to him, to loving others, and it's open-ended. It requires that we are in, and all that we have is an expression of our love, as Jesus intends for us. If we do this, Jesus promises another thing. Jesus will ask his Father to send what is referred to in the Greek, in the New Testament times, as uh, an attorney. Jesus is leaving. We talked about that last week. He's going to prepare a place for us, and as he's leaving us, he's going to hand us over to another, a lawyer. Go figure. Well, that sounds pretty bad, but what is the role of an attorney, but rather to serve as one who gives evidence that stands up in court? To soften the legalese, the scripture translators have used a more welcoming term, uh, a term that Jesus is promising us an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a comforter, a helper, the paraclete. The, the, in this discourse to follow outside of this particular text, we start to understand what the promise of the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, really is. And we're going to cover that over these next few coming weeks as you see the evidence of how the Spirit works in and for us. But here are just a few promises of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is going to disclose to us. He informs us that the Holy Spirit will never leave us. Jesus has already told us that he will be leaving us, but we can't follow him to where he's going, so we're promised that the Holy Spirit will never leave us. Upon the death of my father, a friend who knew that my mother had died just shy two years previously made an observation that I was now an orphan. I'm an orphan, I thought. I've never really considered this, but she was right. But Jesus tells us that he will not leave us orphaned. No matter what God gives us for any particular season, Jesus will never leave or orphan you either. Another promise is that the Holy Spirit will teach and remind us. Jesus says, I have spoken all these things to you while I'm with you, but the companion, the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you everything that I have told you. The Holy Spirit will testify. I will send the advocate, the spirit of truth, and he will come for, to you from Father and will testify all that is about me. You will also testify about me because you have been with me from the very beginning of my ministry. Jesus tells them that in John chapter 15, verse 26. And the Holy Spirit will convict people of their sins. As Jesus continues the conversation, uh, in John 15, we start to hear and sense a sadder and sadder sense to what's happening. He's preparing to leave them. And he finally says to us, this is the best thing for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate will not come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming day. The promise is, is that it's not up to us to convince, convict people of who they are with or without God. The Holy Spirit does that. 
We're just commanded to love those who cross our path along the way that God sends us. And the Holy Spirit will guide us. John 16, 13, and 14, Jesus will no longer be there to show the correct path for us to follow. But the Spirit of truth comes. He will guide us along all truth, and he will speak on his own. But I will tell you that he will, has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory, Jesus says, by telling you that whatever he receives from me, all this belongs to the Father is mine. And that's why he says it, the Spirit, I will tell you, he receives from me. So the Spirit comes from Jesus and the Father. Now briefly, let's talk about the reading from 1 Peter. I want you to think about this for a moment. Can you think of a time when you were punished for doing what you believed was right? Or maybe another way to phrase that is, can you think of a time when you were punished for doing what is right? So my friends, as you think about that time, did you feel blessed? Probably not while we're going through the experience, but if you have the opportunity to look back over time, oftentimes we can see as we come out of this and we look back how something that we had never even imagined came to a reality, despite that difficult time. Peter is encouraging the church not to be fearful, which may preclude us from doing good for God that God would want us to do. He's encouraged them not to be intimidated. Gosh, don't you wish he also added, don't be arrogant either. I mean, allow the Christ who resides in us to be the source of hope that you can share with others. He's telling us. Sometimes doing the right thing is difficult. The Apostle Peter is speaking to a church, reminding them that no harm will come to those who are eager to do good. Even if you suffer for doing good, what is right, you are blessed. But we know, don't we, my friends, that these are difficult times. Not times of war necessarily, but times of disease, and particularly the COVID-19 restrictions. Well, those who are essential employees, the doctors, the nurses, the police, the grocery store workers, and many, many poor people put their own lives at risk by going out and serving in their various vocation and careers. They know the fear of what it is to make sacrifices during this COVID-19 time. I hear stories about people who have actually isolated themselves from their families. While they may come home, they're sleeping in the garage or the basement so that their families can't be around them just in case they may bring home the illness. They put themselves at great risk for our benefits. And we who are deemed the non-essential have placed and respected the stay-at-home mandates have made sacrifices of our own for not doing as we please. And yes, we can't go where we please or when we please. We've experienced these own changes and it's not always been easy to sacrifice in this way. It is our own offering to honor and to care for others. In a variety of forms, church leaders have made decisions not to hold in-person worship because it was our way to show Christ's love. For those churches that have chosen not to be intimidated and decided to meet despite warnings, it is my understanding that they are actually testing God's providence by meeting during this pandemic, having experienced the results of their own foolhardiness sometimes with deaths within their own congregation that were caused quite innocuously by trying to be welcoming and loving only to allow someone to come in who may not have been visibly ill, but still carried the virus. So making space and moving forward will be measured and decisions will be informed by local and state jurisdictions as well as the decisions from our own denomination. Friends, we will not be rushed into something that we do not feel that we are ready to do. You have found, we have found, and our staff is resourcing some very creative ways in which our congregation continues to thrive and serve and share in the good news of Jesus Christ. 
from week to week via Zoom to virtual Bible studies, by making calls to people within our community and talking on the telephone, by joining us for worship online and on Sunday mornings, Pastor Ken's own radio broadcasts on WTTR. All of these are means in which we are staying in touch with one another. We are being the church together, despite the fact that we cannot gather together. And we are reaching more people through streaming and online services than we could ever do by being here at Center in Maine. In time, I know that we will come back to worshiping at Center in Maine. I know, and our new normal will be exciting and busy. What we have learned during this time has not been easy, but there will be a blessing that comes out of all of this, because I know that God works that way. It's not me being optimistic, it's God being faithful to you and to me, to all of us as we go through this together. And so we come full circle, my friends, reminding ourselves that the church is not a place that we go to, it's who we are and it's where we are. And as a means to express this this morning, I encourage you to take time to reach out and give your family and your friends a virtual hug if you need to, or a greeting, or if they're with you in that room, the peace of Christ be with you, and you can turn to each other and share that peace. I invite you now, turn to someone, now or after worship if you're alone right now, and remind them that you are loved, that you love them, that God loves them. And we hope that they can find some love within themselves as well. Amen. Friends, as we break open our lives with discussion together, this week in the scripture, we're encouraged to obey Christ's command, which is to love God and love neighbor. And if we look at that, we consider the fact that we're also called to love ourselves. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourselves. Sometimes easier to love our neighbor than sometimes ourselves. But we're also reminded probably by, you know, modern day uh, psychology that would sit there and say, you can't love other people unless you love yourself. And so, what have you done lately to bless and to sanctify the Holy Christ's presence in your life? How do you love yourself? How do you take care of yourself during this particularly difficult time? How are you blessing yourself? Have you witnessed people doing the right thing for others? Or if you can't think of something of this past week, what do you have in your memory as something or someone that showed the Christ in them to another? What mission trip? What Sunday school class? What walking along the street and greeting someone? what is calling somebody. Let's take some time at our breakout sessions to talk about these questions. We're gonna take five minutes to talk. And uh, for those of you, of you that are on Facebook, we encourage you to use the chat feature. Those of you who are in our Zoom study, we're gonna break you out into rooms. I'm gonna encourage you to unmute your microphones and share with each other. How would you complete this sentence? I honor the Holy Christ in me by taking care of myself and others in, when, and where. Now don't neglect that part about honoring the holy and taking care of yourself as well as others in your responses with your groups. We'll see you in just five minutes.
It is difficult in this moment not to be near some of the people we love and might be worried about. Take a moment to say out loud or in the chat comments the names of people you wish were right there next to you at your table today. As we name them, they are present with us in our hearts. We also want to call to mind the people we cannot name, whose names we do not know, but we know they need our prayers and God's comfort. For those who have lost loved ones, for those who are sick and recovering, for those who are caring for loved ones who are sick at home, for those who are caring for persons in medical care, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are feeling alone and isolated, for those who are helping and are so very tired, for those who are struggling to find friends, food and comfort, for those who are afraid, for those who are missing out on life's milestones, proms, graduations, weddings and birthdays, for those who are being thrust into new roles as educators, caregivers, and learning to work at home in shared spaces. Let us go to God in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us take another breath of spirit as our amen. We know that God sends out our prayers and the spirit, breath of God, is blowing from within us outward as a spirit of compassion and presence. friends, it's time to give praise to God. Time to praise God, to raise up those endorphins levels inside ourselves that is both healthy uh, within ourselves physically and spiritually. And so to start this affirmation, I want you to repeat after me. We've been doing this every week, and so it should be familiar by this point in time. I want great enthusiasm from you. We know that Jesus is present amongst us. Repeat. We know that Jesus is present amongst us. Repeat again. We know that Jesus is present amongst us even in this very house, even in this very house. We will not be feared, we'll have a fear to be louder than love, but with glad hearts and rejoicing souls. We will sing God's praises, for indeed we are an Easter people. Friends, 
That was wonderful. We know Jesus is present amongst all those who are working so hard right now. And so we want to be present and understand how we can be and offer comfort to someone who may be feeling anxious. So I want you to make a plan today. How will you reach out and let people know that they are loved by God? And now receive this benediction. Jesus is spoken in the opening chapter of John's gospel as the incarnation, the powerful word of God that takes on human flesh, both human and divine, God and humanity wrapped together. Among his many displays of power, we see how Jesus calms the storm with a word. He raises the dead with a prayer and he heals and cures the sick and infirmed with an easy touch. Jesus was present at the creation of the world. He sits at the right hand of God and he will sit in the heavenly throne room at the consummation of the creation, the new heaven and the new earth. As the son of God, he has been and continues to be and will always be present in our lives and through the advocate will empower and teach us and remind us of God's love for us and our love for others. In and through the ministry of Jesus, we experience his promises and his power, and we certainly experience the presence of God. And so may that presence of God, God Father, God Son, and God the Holy Spirit, bless and keep you all this day and forevermore. Until we gather again, amen and amen.